appreciate you, Desmond. We're glad to see you taking more and more apart, and that's really good. Did a great job. We appreciate that this evening. Tonight, and we're glad to have everybody back. Thank you for coming. Tonight, we're going to study about the invitation God has given to you and me to live in all manner of holiness. We're going to look at a passage there from 1 Peter chapter 1, and a good bit of what we'll say comes from Peter's account, but some other passages will be used as well. This is from the King James Version, and it says this, But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Okay, as we talk about that tonight, you understand that God is issuing that invitation. He is asking you to come holy like he is holy. And his people must be just that. Do you notice in that scripture, in the, that, the way that's rendered, like I said, it's King James Version. It says, in all manner of conversation. Let me go ahead and get out. The word conversation there in the King James Version. Back then, that word did not mean your words. It meant your life. And if you look at other translations, as we will in a minute, you'll see it's talking about the way that you live. But really what I want you to emphasize is that in regard to God inviting you and I to become holy individuals, he talks about the, the fact in all manner, in all ways, he wants us to become holy. That's a phrase that the King James Version uses a lot, in all manner. It's 31 times in the old and 10 times in the new. And it is a Greek word, a simple little Greek word, P-A-S, that means all, any, every, the whole of what there is, in other words. And it's commonly used in the scripture, that word is. But what we need to see about it is the call to be holy, he's saying, is in all of what you do. All manner of your life, every aspect of the Christian's life. So all, any, every, the whole of your life is what God is issuing you, this invitation to become holy. Be ye holy. Now, here's a little bit more modern version of what we read. And it says, and I'm reading the fuller context clearly, he says at verse 13 through 16, Therefore gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that's to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conforming yourself to the former lust as in your ignorance. The former lust for what they did back in their lives before they became Christians. That's how we used to live, Peter says. But we don't want to be conformed to that anymore. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all of your conduct. Because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. Now that statement, the idea of holiness, what, do, what does that mean? What does it mean when the Bible says something or someone is holy? Well, it means to be set apart, distinctive and holy for the Lord, set apart, dedicated to God, used for his purposes. And therefore, it requires of you to act a certain way, requires you to live a certain way because you live set apart for the Lord. And when we talk about God being holy, because God... Peter says there that God says, be holy for I am holy. When we speak of God being holy, the root idea of that is different. In other words, God is different. God said that about himself. He said, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. So God shows himself that I'm not like you. I think differently from you. I, I act differently from you. And so God wants us, of course, to conform more to his ways. But there is a definite difference between man and God in that regard. Now, what's the basis for this invitation? Well, when Peter quotes this, be holy for I'm holy, he's quoting from Leviticus. And that's not just a one-time use. That phrase begins and ends at certain sections of Leviticus. And what it does is, as God tells the people about his laws, to distinguish them from everybody else and to recognize their holiness, God just comes back again and again saying, Be holy, for I am holy. 
And that occurs in several of these passages which we'll quickly look at. Like in Leviticus 11, it says, I'm the Lord your God. You shall therefore consecrate yourselves, and you shall be holy, for I am holy. Neither shall you defile yourselves with any creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. For I am the Lord who brings you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. Man had an obligation. God's people have an obligation. If they're going to belong to God, they have to act like God in this regard. Be holy for I am holy. Chapter 19, the Lord spoke to Moses. said, You speak to all the congregation of the children of Israel, and you say, shall say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Then again in Leviticus 20, verse 7, Consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am the Lord your God. You know, God is our God, and what's different about him from all the other gods that mankind had ever worshipped? And you know that I'm not saying those were real gods, but man calls them that, thinks of them that way. What distinguishes God, our God, the God of the Bible, from all other gods was this claim to holiness. And uh, it says in Exodus chapter 15, verse 11, Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you? glorious in holiness. We all know that a lot of the so-called gods, and we kind of typically think of ancient Rome and Greek gods because a lot of us had studied that. I did in school. Learn about all those different gods and who they were and what their Latin names were and what their Roman names were. I don't really know why, you know, if we had to know all of that and why that was so important. But anyway, we learned about that, read about that, and studied about that. One thing I remember, they tell the stories of those gods. And of course, all of it was acknowledged as myth. But when they tell the stories of those gods, one thing I always got to thinking about was, man alive, these guys are worse than the worst people that we know. Their gods were terrible people. They hated and they despised man. and They didn't want to do anything for man except rule over him and, and mistreat him sometimes. And they did horrible acts together. In other words, it, it was constant depravity amongst those gods. And you begin to realize the one God that we ever read about whose claim to fame was holiness is the God of the Bible. That's what distinguishes our God. So we're not worshiping those other gods. We're worshiping our God. And because he's our God, we have different obligations. If you wanted to be a worshiper of, you know, Zeus or, you know, Diana or ones like that, well, they would require of you ungodly behavior sometimes, but what God requires us to be is holy. So we're patterning ourselves after the nature of God. That's what God is asking us to do. And as we see over and over again, the basis of him saying you be holy is the fact that God's asking us to be what his character is like. Let's look at some of those passages. What, what do we know about God? We know, among other things, that God is so holy he can't be tempted to evil. That's one of the things different about God. He doesn't do evil. He can't be tempted by evil. God's perfect in his holiness. God's distinct. And uh, it's so to the point where he cannot feel the power of temptation in his deity. He cannot look at sin and, and feel drawn to it because that's not God's nature. Or we look at Isaiah chapter 40. God says, To whom then will you liken me, or to whom shall I be equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these things, who brings out their host by number. He calls them by name. Talk about the stars there. By the greatness of his might, by the strength of his power, not one of them is missing. Who would you compare God to? And several times in the Bible he's called the Holy One. Or again in Psalm 78, 41. Uh, yes, and again, and again, they tempted God and they limited the Holy One of Israel. That Holy One concept keeps coming up in the Old Testament. He's the Holy One. God is the Holy One. And we have to treat Him and respect Him like that. We have to understand that this is part of His divine nature. And when we consider God's holiness about all of this, we understand that God is perfect in holiness. Now that's what we're dealing with. We have to grasp that. God's approaching holiness with the idea of perfection. It's God's prerogative to say what holy is. 
not us. You and I don't have a right on this call. God decides who's holy and what's holy. And men really don't have any authority to define that because we don't even approach holiness. Somebody looks at something out here in the world and you get to talking about it and they say, well, I don't see anything wrong with that. I can't understand why you think that's wrong. Or It, it seems to me like this or that or, or this has become very popular among those who seem to believe in God but they don't want to follow God's word or be holy themselves. Well, God wants me to be happy. Well, really, you know, if you go back to Scripture, happiness is a byproduct of obeying God. God, yeah, God wants you to be happy, but that's not God's main concern. Your faithfulness and obedience is a bigger concern, and God thinks you'll be happier if you do that. God never justifies our sinful conduct by the idea, well, I, you know, I want you to be happy. Well, you know, when we're raising children, we, we want them to be happy, of course, but sometimes we punish them anyway. We spank them. We make them very unhappy, even though, in our minds, the overall goal is I'd like for them to be happy, but right this minute, I don't mind them being a little unhappy if it corrects them. God isn't happy about all of our ways. God's word is the, the final arbiter. Now, it's, it's what he's got to say that constitutes what holiness is. Remember Jeremiah 10, 23, the Lord, he says, O Lord, I know the way of man's not in himself. It's not in man who walks to direct his steps. That's, a, that's really, if you think about it, that shows a big problem with us. So if we're going to go before God and say, well, don't you want me to be happy or don't you want to give me what I really want? If we're going to say that, our problem is that over here, God's saying about us is you don't have that capacity to know what you need the most. You think you do. All of us think we do, but God says you don't. I didn't even put that within you. It's not within you to direct your own steps. Proverbs says, 14 verse 12 says, there's a way that seems right to man, at the end is the way of death. So we can easily mistake the right way. In Romans 10 verse 1 through 3 talks about Paul is writing there about Israel, and he says, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. I bear them witness. They do have a zeal for God, but it's not according to knowledge. They don't know what God wants them to do. They're missing in that. They have zeal, but not good knowledge. And being ignorant of God's righteousness, they try to establish their own version of righteousness. But they didn't submit themselves to God's kind of righteousness. These are things we have to admit and acknowledge if we're going to be holy people. And that is, we have to come to an understanding. I'm not really in that good a shape as a human being to direct my own paths. I need God's help to know what I need to be to be like him in holiness. When Nadab and Abihu were punished by God, the fire left out because they had offered strange fire, a fire that God had not commanded. Moses said to Aaron, this is what the Lord spoke, saying, by those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy. Before all this people, I must be glorified. So Aaron held his peace. We talk about the holiness of man now. And here's something we have to acknowledge. That when we talk about the holiness of man, that's far different from God's standards of holiness. we got to grasp holiness is perfect in God. There's, there's nothing wrong with him. In other words, there's nothing missing. There's no failures in his character. He is distinctive and set apart into perfection. In Isaiah 5, verse 24, he says, Who will not fear you, O Lord, and bring glory to, that, to, uh, to your name? For you alone are holy. Why I read that passage is because we have to remember when, when the Bible calls upon us and God's inviting us and he's saying, Be ye holy, for I am holy, and that's all well and good. But we, when all is said and done and we have tried to become holy as God is holy, we also understand that it can rightfully be said not one of us is holy as God is holy. That passage said you alone in truth fit the standard of holiness. It is a little frightening sometimes when you stop and consider what the Bible says, Habakkuk 1 verse 3, 13 rather, it says your eyes are too pure to look on evil and you cannot tolerate wrong. 
but see, that's God looking at you and me. So he, he sees inconsistencies in us, and he sees failures in us, and, and he says, sees weaknesses in us. What I'm trying to get across is that, that there is a legitimate side to the holiness of God that just far surpasses anything that we could ever hope to be. And we have to get that before us and understand that we approach God as sinners and we approach God in failure sometimes and we understand that we don't always live up to this to perfection. That doesn't mean that the invitation to be holy as he is holy is invalidated. It means we have to start by recognizing this. God's superior holiness. But this does impress us with one thing, and that is if you're going to be called by God and he's going to look at you and say, now you start being holy as I am holy, we all understand if God's holiness is to that kind of perfection, you and I are going to have to put forth an enormous effort, a strong effort, to become holy. This won't happen, in other words, accidentally. And you think about it in Ephesians 2, it kind of describes this process. As we're modeling ourselves, it's going to require, first off, that you put off things that had to do with the person you were before you became a Christian. There were ways that you lived and ways that you thought that has to stop. You have to put those away. And I, I'll tell you where we go wrong right here with a lot of people is they don't think anything's ever been wrong with them. They look at themselves and, and for whatever reason they cannot see any problems or inconsistencies or errors in their life. They try to shut that off and think only of their good and, and they don't see what needs to change. And God's looking at us, and, and modern man, we throw up our hands and say, oh, that offends me. That hurts my feelings, God, that you would say that to me. That bothers me, God, that, that you would think I'm not perfect just like I am. And here the Lord is saying, there's a lot about you that needs to go away. Put it off. Get it away from you. It's like a dirty garment, and you need to take it off. That was your former manner of person. That old man, I'm not calling one person an old man, he's just saying what used to be you has grown corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. We need to have a new spirit and a new mind, and then we have to put on the new man. And the new man, as you see there, is modeled after the true righteousness and holiness of God. So what we're trying to do is get off what we once were and put on what we need to become. That's the whole process of a Christian, and, and I understand that to a, partly needs to take place, obviously, when we first obey the gospel. But he's not saying that to people that just obey the gospel. He's talking about Christians that have been long established. Really, brethren, our life goes on and on with the process of putting off and putting on, taking off what doesn't need to be there and putting on what does. It's really a constant challenge to be renewed in the spirit of our mind and, and, and get ourselves away from the manner of life that we may have once engaged in or once was a part of, of worldly type thinking. So what I'm trying to get you to understand in this is if that's a constant challenge, then holiness doesn't happen automatically. It happens because we apply ourselves. We put, it off, put off things that aren't very holy and we put on things that are. <clears throat> and I'll tell you, I could get up here tonight and talk about how we all ought to love one another, and that's exactly right. That's a part of a right conduct. I could get up here tonight and talk about the glory and beauty of heaven. I could get up tonight and talk about several things, but for some reason or another, those things are things that captivate our attention, and we'll go out of here saying, boy, that, you know, that's right. I love to hear about that. I have found one thing. Holiness is not necessarily one of those talk. It's not one of those kind of things everybody, boy, you know, I love, I love that idea of being holy. Because holiness is a real challenge. It, it's, it's asking you to defy you. It's asking you to be better than you have been. It's asking you to pattern yourself after a standard that is greater than you could ever really hope to be. And still challenging you to live that way. 
It is required. Look at Hebrews 12, 14. Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. Did you ever think about that? Holiness is required to get a clear view of God. When I pursue holiness, I start understanding more about God. I see the true picture of God. Mankind has developed a lazy view of God. Our lazy view of God is he's sweet. He's like a grandfather who holds you in his lap and pats on you and says he loves you. And when it comes discipline time, he hands you back to the parents so they can do the dirty work because God really doesn't want to do anything like that. That God is nice. And he is glorious and he is sweet and he, his precepts are wonderful. But that's not God. It's just not the right picture. And he's saying we've got to see the Lord as he is. Whether it fits our image of how things ought to be or not, this is what we have to understand about the Lord. And God's word shows us his holiness. God has spoken in his holiness, Psalm 60, verse 6 says. Okay, we've got a little bit of time left. We're going to break down some other things that Peter said here. Uh, and what Peter does is kind of take the concept of holiness and then begin to flesh it out and say, okay, well, in this relationship, this is how your holiness ought to behave. So, so look at it this way. He talks about how, how holiness makes you act towards your brethren. He talks about how holiness behaves itself towards those of the world. He tells you how being holy and dedicated to God would act towards those who have authority and government and things like that. And then lastly, he talks about with our spouses, what's required of husbands and wives. And we won't explore these in tremendous depth, but we need to see. And here again now, what, was, what we talked about earlier, God defines it, not you and me, but God defines how we ought to live and what represents his standards in these areas. What would the word of God, what would the Lord say in regard to these various subjects. Well, holiness in relationship to the brethren, the basis of that is clearly love. And I said a minute ago, that's, that's a fine thing, and that's one of those things we want to see. And he talks about, we're fixing to read the passage in Peter there, but he talks about and emphasizes, now watch for this, sincere love, in other words, not a fake love, not a smile at you and then knock you in the back love, a sincere love that's unhypocritical, a brotherly kind of love. Now, there's really two kind of loves talked about. There's a fervent love in this text, and that's, that's that agape love we've described before that's willing to sacrifice and do for you, and, and you may not be beautiful, but I, I still love you. You may not be perfect, but I still love you. You may be my enemy, but I still love you. I have a fervent love in that regard, but I have a brotherly love towards my brethren. In other words, I have a special relationship with them. Now let's read the text. Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit in a sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. Love as God would expect you to love. Love with that kind of conviction. Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever because all flesh is as grass and all the glory of man like the flower of the grass. The grass withers and its flower falls off, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Now this is the word by which by the gospel was, now this is the word which by the gospel was preached to you. He's saying, look, we have told you of high principles. We have asked and called upon you to love one another fervently. So if you want to understand what's your relationship, how does holiness behave in regard to your brethren? In what way? He, he's given us a few indicators there. We sincerely love the brethren, but we love them in purity. It's a real love. It's not a lust love. It's not a hypocritical love. It's a pure love. We love them out of purity of heart. We don't love, brethren, because, hey, I might be able to get something out of them. I might be able to 
you know, buy something from them or sell them something, I might be able to to make friends with that person and I can have a best buddy in all the world and have somebody to run with. That's not what we're talking about. Those are all fine things. They're not evil things particularly, but we love them because God wants us to love them because we are pure in our motives. We're not, you know, sometimes people love one another because they just want a good friend. And, and it's hard to fault that, but but God wants us to love one another whether we're best friends and we go do something together all the time or not. He still wants us to love one another. And we're to have the right attitude towards each other. So all of these things he's laying emphasis. And notice that he talked about the fervency of this kind of love. Love fervently. This is some of the things that we behave. This is how we act when we listen to God. Love leads us to things, Peter says, like compassion, tenderheartedness, courtesy, blessing people, doing good, and seeking peace. Let's, doing good to all. All of this applies. Let's read again. Finally, all of you. See, in, in the text, Peter's had to talk to slaves and masters. He's talked to husbands and wives. He's been talking to how we act towards the government. Some of these things I'll get to in a minute been talking about all these different things but he says now listen all of us all of us we need to be of one mind towards another we need to have the heart of compassion for one another we need to love one another like we are brothers family members like we think of each other that way we need to exhibit because of that tender heartedness don't be cold in your heart towards others. Have your heart open. Be tender in the way you think about them. Be courteous. Show just the common courtesy that ought to be exhibited. He says, don't return evil for evil. Somebody reviles you and says something against you, don't return it in kind. He said, instead, bless knowing that you were called so that you could inherit a blessing. He quotes from the Old Testament. And he, Peter says, For he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. We have to have that kind of attitude, Peter says. Now, <clears throat> When we talk about holiness then and how does it affect our relationship between one another, that's it right there. This is how, the kind of ways that we have to act to exhibit the holiness of God. That passage goes on. <coughs> the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. His ears are open to their prayers. The face of the Lord is against those that do evil. In other words, the Lord's looking at us and he's saying, I want to see compassion. I want to see tenderheartedness. I want to see fervent love. I want to see these attitudes towards one another. That's what I'm looking for as I look. And so the Lord is opening his ear to you if that's the way you are, and he's against you if you do evil. Who's going to harm you if you do and follow what's good? And he says, even if you suffer for righteousness' sake, you're blessed. Don't be afraid of people's threats. Don't be troubled. Keep God sanctified in your heart. Always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you of a reason for the hope that's in you with meekness and fear. How about people out there in the world? Well, Peter has something to say about that. He emphasizes our influence in this text. And he talks about the godly life that we'll have to have and abstaining from the things of the world. The world... Listen, the world's always going to be looking at you as a Christian. They're going to be looking for that chink in your armor. They're going to be looking to see where's your hypocrisy. They're going to be watching for that moment when you don't live up to God's expectation. The devil's watching for that moment, and the world is watching for that moment to see if you're real. So Peter says, Beloved, I beg you, as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul having your conduct unhonorable among the Gentiles, 
that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. He, he's talking about that within the context, your conduct being honorable among the Gentile world out there. And, of course, he's dealing with some who are Jewish Christians and, and uh, are away from their home, and they're living out there among the Gentiles. And he's saying, I want you to live in an honorable way among them. Abstain from fleshly lusts that war against the soul. He says, you're like sojourners, you're like pilgrims. Imagine you are off this night in another country. You're living in another land. And out there, the, the customs and the ways may be different. He's saying, while you're in that land, live honorably. You know, all of us, if, we're in, if we were in another country, uh, we'd probably be conscientious because it would be easy to slip up not knowing all of the rules and regulations. But the last thing you want to do is wind up in trouble with the local officials of, you know, a foreign land. And so you might be extra cautious and say, well, I'm just passing through here. You'd want to be extra cautious. And so he says, well, we are just passing through. So keep your conduct honorable. He said, they may criticize you anyway, but when they really find out what you like, they'll find out they were wrong, and they'll ultimately glorify God. Peter brings up the fact, he said, when you try to do right, some people are going to think it's strange. This is holiness. In other words, how holiness behaves towards the world. You can't influence another to be righteous if we're not going to be righteous ourselves. But when we are righteous in the midst of the world, you notice here how the world reacts sometimes. We have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles, Peter says. We walk in the lewdness and lust and drunkenness and revelries and drinking parties and abominable idolatry. In regard to these things, they think it strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation. That's always been an interesting phrase. A flood of dissipation. Here he said, here is all of them, and they're just, you know, they're like a flood, like a tsunami coming at you, and, and it's just flooding in on you, all of this ungodly conduct and everything. And, and, you know, if you're caught in a flood, if you're caught in a tsunami, and that water's rushing, it, it's just only natural to, to go with it, isn't it? I mean, of course, literally, you can't hardly help it in that case. But... As a Christian, here comes a flood, a tidal wave of ungodliness at us. And what happens when we stand our ground? Have you ever walked, maybe like the mall somewhere, and everybody's coming one direction, and you're walking in the direction they're coming? In other words, here they're coming towards you, and you walk, and people are having to park by, and after a while, you know, it's almost like driving on the wrong side of the road. People look at you, what, what in the world are you doing? And it says, here are these people, here's their whole flood of dissipation, and they're looking at you like, why aren't you going our way? What in the world's wrong with you? Why won't you go to the drinking party we're having? What's wrong with you? How come you won't go bow down to our God? How come you won't, you know, laugh at our lewd jokes? What's the matter with you? He says, they think you're strange. They think it's odd that you won't behave like they behave. You won't go with their flood. So he says, remember, they will give an account of, to him who's ready to judge the living and the dead. Remember, we're all accountable. And we have to keep in mind that even though some may think we're strange for standing up and being different, that's a noble thing in God's sight. That's a part of this holiness that's being talked about. We have to be holy in regard to those over us in the law of the land, obedience towards both the government and the ordinances that the government establishes. Peter says, whether it's kings or governors, they're there to punish the evildoer. Look at this. Therefore, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king is supreme or to the governors or to those who are sent by him, for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. He says, I want you to behave in a right and righteous way before the eyes of human government. It's not that they're perfect, and it's not that they will always do the right thing. 
it is that I want you to live holy before their eyes. But basically he's saying, I don't want any charge against you. I don't want them to say that you're a bunch of rebel rousers. I don't want, to, I don't want them to look at you and say that you don't, you don't obey the law of the land. What about husbands and wives? Peter talks about this. And he says, for the wife, there must be submission. Such a way that we'd be able to win a, win a mate without even using a word. It's just our very example would be good. A beautiful, gentle, quiet spirit. Look at what Peter says. Wives, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. An absolute, upstanding, righteous woman trying to behave right, live right, love the Lord, serve the Lord, who puts her priorities of the kingdom first, who in her wildest imagination would not be unfaithful to her husband, who behaves in a chaste way. By that we mean that she is respective of godly behavior. She's a woman who who lives in such a way that it befits godliness, in other words. She's not immoral and she doesn't even lean anywhere that direction. And she's accompanied by a respect, a fear in the sense of respect. And, and it is a woman who's a whole lot more than looks. She may adorn her hair and she may put on a dress and she may put on some jewelry, but you see in her more than some kind of, as some people call it, trophy wife, She's not just somebody to look good. She is good. That's what Peter is saying. If you want to be a holy wife, here's how you be it. It's a, you know, every husband wants his wife to look pretty and, and like she cares about something. To adorn herself in a way that, that looks nice and light. But the Lord says we better be able to see more than that a gentle and quiet spirit. So that's precious in the sight of God. She needs to be somebody that is respectful. The women who trusted God adorned themselves with a spirit towards their mates that cooperated and they could count on them with that cooperation. A submission and a yielding to a husband's authority. That's holy behavior. That's what God wants us to be like. For the husband, there was a lady one time I was conducting Bible class. That's when I preached at the loop. There was a little couple, and to be honest with you, they, they had troubles with one another quite a bit. And I was in class, and I was going over 1 Peter chapter 3 here, and I, in 1 Peter 3, verses 1 through 6 are about the wives, and then verse 7 comes along, and one verse talks about the husband. And... When I got through, I mean, that's how I did it. I, I went through the text. I got to verse 7. I talked about it. And then class was about over. And man, alive, she stormed up the aisle towards me, and she got in my face after it was over. The wife did. And she said, you spent a long time in class on them women, and you didn't hardly say nothing about them, <laughs> about them men. Well, we don't, mean to <laughs> we don't mean it that way. But listen, <coughs> guys, if you think, that this is all about, let's get the woman straightened out, and then everything's going to be fine. Well, remember now, Peter deals with us men too. As a matter of fact, when he deals with us in verse 7, he says, likewise. So he's about to say something kind of similar. He said, just like that wife needs to be respectful of her husband and the role he's got to play, he turns it around on the men and says, uh-huh, you also have to do that. In your position of headship, you have to practice holiness and love. Now let's look at how that works. Husbands, likewise, dwell with them with understanding. You give honor to them. Give honor to your wife as to the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers not be hindered. So he just simply took a husband and said, okay, big guy, if you think that all this is all about me, 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 and and having my way, he says, I want you to understand holiness. Holiness behaves by turning around and say, look, you know, I'm going to try to be the most understanding man I need to know how to be. I, 
I'm going to try to realize that my wife has things that she needs and, and respect her and I will honor her and I will look at her the right way. I will treat her as a fellow heir of the grace of life. Not like she's underneath my feet somewhere or another. I need to have the right attitude, he's saying. So he's, he's saying, holy, holy women submit and act chaste and have put on a, a right spirit. And holy men act right towards their wives and try to be understanding and try to show respectful honor to them. Husbands, love your wives just like Christ. Love the church and gave himself for her. That's one part of it. A lot of times we do never get around to. It's a love that gives itself up. That's the nature of that kind of love. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1 says, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let's cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. Let's perfect holiness in the fear of God. You know what he's saying? All of us have a challenge to work at being more holy in the way we behave. Accept that challenge. God has given you an invitation. Remember, God says, you be holy as I am holy. And that goes out to every child of God here tonight. And if you're not a Christian, you need to come into Christ, and then you need to accept that challenge. You be holy for I am holy. God's challenging us to change our world, change our view, change our behavior, and live by his standards. And his standards are much better than our standards as far as human beings go. We've got to, we've got to believe in these promises. Cleanse yourself from these things and start perfecting holiness. I won't ever be God. I won't ever be like him in that perfection. But nevertheless, he calls on me to step to the plate and become more of what I need to be. This is all of our call, all of our job. Like a lot of invitations of God, you can choose to or not to, but if you choose not to, you'll face a consequence. God asks us to invite you to come to him and obey the gospel. You don't have to do that unless you want to be saved. If you need to obey the gospel, why not tonight? We're going to stand and sing. Please come.